have many things to do today. Let's get started. So about midterms, uh, there were a couple of questions. Um, you can use one piece of paper, a uh, letter format, two sides as your cheat sheet. Um, you can write everything on that, but you, cannot, you have to do that yourself. So you cannot get from your friends. So it should be yours, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. So you can do whatever you want. Um, but you cannot use books. You cannot use printed slides. Um, that's clear so far, right? And the other thing we want to do that after the midterm, you can submit your cheat sheet as well. And there will be a competition, and the best one will get some extra <laughs> points. <laughs> right? So it's completely optional. If you want, you can do it. If you want to keep it, that's fine. And we will, the best one we will upload to our the, uh, cl uh, website as well. So make it impressive. And um, I think we will have about 75 minutes uh, for the midterm. And there will be many questions, but we try to make them simple. So a few minutes for each of them. Sounds good? It will be fun. Um, write a few. We haven't decided yet how many we want, right? Uh, well, between eight and twelve, short questions. So seventy-five minutes. Right, but short questions, and probably it's still good if you don't solve all all of them, so you can still pass. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to cover as much as possible with questions. That's why there will be many of them. <clears throat> okay, so the plan for today is that uh, quickly we recap uh, primal dual logarithmic barrier methods for LP. Then we continue with semi-definite programming, um, some basic properties and applications. And after that, Ryan is uh, going to summarize what we have learned so far. On Thursday, um, we will continue with um, solutions for uh, semi-definite programming. And then we will continue with summarizing what we have learned so far. And I also want to discuss um, how to optimize um, over matrices, so how to do matrix calculus. So, so far, um, in most of these optimization problems, the, uh, our cost function was defined over an n-dimensional Euclidean space, except semi-definite programming. And uh, I want to discuss what we can do, what tricks we can do when we have to optimize over matrices. <clears throat> so last time, we discussed uh, primal, uh, we discussed how to do primal dual logarithmic method, logarithmic barrier method for solving LP. Um, we discussed primal and dual form, forms for LP. Um, we also discussed that there are two cases, asymmetric form and symmetric form. And then uh, we introduced, so our problem was uh, to minimize the C transpose X su subject to AX equals V, X is non-negative, we introduced this log barrier function, and we studied the KKT conditions in the optimality. Um, we calculated the derivative of our new objective, which was, it doesn't help if I point on this, right, on my screen of my laptop. So which was uh, this, C minus mu x dx inverse E. I hope you remember the notation. I don't want to uh, define them again. And according to the KKT stationarity condition, this C minus mu dx inverse E has to be A transpose Y in the optimum. <coughs> then we, 
then uh, we rewrote this condition in this form. So we know that in the optimum, uh, this has to be satisfied. So these are the KKT conditions. So we want to find x, y, and s such that these equations hold. And we discussed that everything is linear here except this guy, uh, this one. And because of that, we cannot exactly solve this equation. We can just approximate uh, these equations. And for here, we introduce this notation for the approximation. So instead of just saying that this expression is E, we say that uh, this expression minus E, the norm, is less than some beta. And when beta is zero, then we solve the KKT conditions exactly. Okay. Um, Right, and after that, what we did, um, that we used Newton method to solve these KKT conditions, and the way for uh, that was that we assumed that we have some X bar, Y bar, S bar feasible solutions for which uh, this expression is less than beta, and then after update, we update x bar with delta x, y bar with delta y, um, s bar with delta s. And after this, we want to assume that uh, these equations all hold. So x bar plus del for x bar plus delta x, we have this equation. x bar plus delta x is bigger than 0. For y bar plus delta y, we have this equation. And we want that after this update, uh, this expression is 0. Right, that's uh, here, and we realize that it's an ugly nonlinear system in delta x and delta s. This is, was the nonlinear part, and you remember what we did. We ignored that, and we had a linear system, and we can solve that linear system, and we had these update rules for that. Um, so this is just the pseudocode of everything together. So you start from some x not y not s not. Um, say at iteration k you are in this x bar y bar s bar point. You do this linear system that, that we just discussed. You update your points. So from x, so x k plus one will be x bar plus delta x. Y k plus one is y bar plus delta y. S k plus one is s bar plus delta s. Where you calculate uh, delta x, delta y, delta s from this uh, Newton system. And after this, uh, you decrease this barrier parameter mu with some parameter alpha. So mu k plus 1 will be alpha times mu k, where alpha is between 0 and 1. So this is the whole algorithm. And I mentioned, but I didn't write this formally like here, that so I just mentioned that if uh, we are close to optimum, that is um, for some, this beta is small, so this uh, approximation for the stationary condition that you remember we had oops, here. If this beta is between 0 and 1 half, then you can prove that after this update, one update, if, uh, so for the original system we had this beta approximation, then for the updated uh, parameter, so say x prime y prime, y prime s prime is uh, x bar y bar s bar from the previous iteration plus delta x delta y delta s, then this new uh, uh, these new variables will have um, this approximate solution of the uh, primal problem with parameter mu. 
where the important thing is that it's B squared. And that's what I said, that if you uh, solve uh, the system with Newton, uh, Newton method, then you will have a quadratic uh, convergence. So this is what it shows. So you had a beta approximation. After one update, you will have a beta squared approximation. And if beta is small enough, then with quadratic speed, you converge to zero. Is it okay? So this is where we stopped last time. And after that, I, so if you got lost, then please do this now. But I hope this is just review what we discussed last time, except that I wrote this more formally now. And so what happens is that we fix a mu and we use Newton method and then we would quadratic speed we would converge to this P mu. But actually what we want is that the mu should go to zero as well and what we really care about is that how fast is the overall convergence of this system. And yesterday, I, um, yesterday last week I told you that if you choose this scheduling of mu uh, good enough, then you can still get quadratic rate. And then Ryan and Aditya told me that, hey, it's a bit suspicious. So I looked at what we can get. And um, here is the final result, what you can get. So we have this mu, the barrier uh, parameter, and we want to dec decrease this, right? So in the next step, if we, in this step we have mu, in the next step I want mu prime, which is alpha times mu, where alpha is between zero and one, right? I want this mu to converge to zero. Uh, this is the barrier parameter. And what has been proven, if you choose alpha to be this, a bit a bit strange so n is the dimension of x and suppose uh, that x not uh, oops y not S not is uh, beta three over forty approximation. So solution of the prime uh, primal with barrier parameter mu not. Um, and you do this algorithm that we just discussed. So after k step, you um, your algorithm produces x k, um, y k, s k, this um, primal dual algorithm that we just discussed. And say after this k steps, the duality gap. is uh, epsilon, then you can prove that k is smaller than 10 times square root of n log uh, 
uh, this expression. So that makes more sense now, right? Um, so it's not quadratic convergence, as I said, but we have this standard log 1 over epsilon uh, convergence. Um, this is the duality gap from the starting point. And again, n is the size of the problem. It looks a bit weird, right? This whole statement may be a bit scary. The proof is not that difficult. So if we had another lecture, we could prove it. Um, it's really just many elementary steps, a bit tedious though. Um, and it would be nice to see that, but um, unfortunately we don't have time. If you are interested, come to my office hours. <laughs> okay, you can get cookies too, or I don't know, snacks, popcorn. So we can chat about this too. Um, one thing you have to notice though is that we have square root of n here, and with the ellipsoid method it was n to the fourth. So at least um, we gained some there. Is it clear? So this is the number of iterations. Right. Um, you have an extra, I guess, n cube for solving the yeah. system. Right. So it's just number of iterations, right? Yeah, yeah so the optimum is 3.5, what exists. Um, and that's true that. Um, without that, with the ellipsoid method, we would have n squared here. But still, 3.5 is better than 4. Um, okay, so let's move on. Oh, I wanted to avoid this. And uh, continue with semi-definite programming. Okay, so last time we defined inner product between matrices. We proved some uh, basic properties about uh, uh, positive semi-definite matrices. And then we defined uh, the semi-definite programming this way. Um, that we want, we have a matrix C. We want to minimize this inner product between C and X. Subject to we have these uh, constraints where X is uh, PSD. The, and this was, we discussed that this was a, this is a generalization of LP. And we also defined a dual problem in this way that, um, so again, this, was the, this is the primal problem, and the dual is we want to maximize y transpose b uh, subject to c minus the sum of this yi ai, where yi is a scalar, ai is a matrix, this is PSD. Any question about? these definitions? Definitions are clear. You can see why this is a generalization of LP. Good. <coughs> So the plan now is to discuss a couple of more properties of SDP.
OK, so this is what, where we stopped. Last time that the dual problem is defined uh, like this. Max y transpose b, we maximum maximize this in y and s subject to matrix S, which is C minus some y i a i. This is a PSD. And sometimes uh, the same problem actually is defined uh, like this. We want to minimize C transpose X, so instead of maximize Y transpose D, uh, where X says a uh, n-dimensional vector subject to um, f naught plus x1, f1, and so on, x um, xn, fn. This is PSD where F not uh, and so on, Fn matrices, they are all symmetric matrices. Okay? <coughs> you can see that this is exactly the same as this, right? So here is my question, is the SDP a convex problem or not? So what do we need for this to be a convex problem? Right, so we have, right, so we have an objective function and we have constraints. For a problem to be convex, we need that both the objective and the constraints are convex. What's the objective here? This, is that convex? Right, so what we need to check if these uh, constraints are convex as well, right? So what, is it convex? What's your guess or not? Who thinks SDP is convex? Who thinks it's not? Oh, you are good. Right, so SDP is convex. <coughs> and the proof is um, uh, very simple, right? We just want to, so we de defined the constraints. like this. Um, and we want to prove that if f of x is, so let's say this is f of x. If f of x is PSD, f of y is uh, PSD, then f lambda x plus one minus lambda f of y is PSD as well for some lambda um, between zero and one. And why is this PSD, this? Yes, thanks. I was thinking on the next step. Right, because this is lambda times f of x from the definition of f plus one minus lambda f of y. And this is PSD, this is PSD. Linear complex combination of PSD matrices is PSD. 
right? So after this, <coughs> we can s uh, sketch SDP. So when you think of a SDP problem or how you solve it, you can think of really as, as it was an LP. So in LP, you remember we had a, this uh, hyperplane and we was uh, pushing this uh, till we reached the border of uh, the feasibility domain. And here, everything is the same. So the feasibility domain is that f of x. Uh, so we defined f of x with uh, this equation. f of x is PSD in this domain. f of x is not PSD in this domain. And we just need to push this hyperplane till uh, we get to the optimum point. The difference here, though, is that what was the feasible domain for the LP? It was a polytope. But here, it won't be a polytope anymore. It's more general than that, so it can be curved. And these curves can be any polynomial thing. Um, it can be, yes? Um, but in Rn, we don't have the limit projection of that in Rn. But you ha we have another constraint that uh, the matrix, matrix should be PSD. And that gives you, what does that mean? That it means that, say, your matrix is, I don't know, x. It means that y transpose xy should be non negative for all y's. And this gives you infinite many other constraints. So you can think of this as an LP with infinite many other constraints. <clears throat> so we discussed that we generalized SDLP and then we got SDP and you can prove it uh, formally as well. So we ha have this CRM that any LP is a special case of say special you know, instance of an SDP problem. Um, do you want to see this formally or you believe it or you can do that yourself too? Who wants to see the proof or want to? Who doesn't want to see the proof? Among those who is that cannot prove but still doesn't want to see. Okay, so <clears throat> what's an LP? An LP is you want to minimize C transpose X subject to AX plus B is non-negative, right? Um, this is LP. In SDP, your problem is you want to minimize um, C transpose X subject to F naught plus x1 times f1, xm times fm. Uh, this is PSD. And we just need to find um, matrix f0, f1, fm, such that this problem is equivalent to this problem. Oh. So the, sorry, the, we need to find f0, f1, fm matrices, such that this SDP problem will be equivalent to this problem. So tell me what would be a good F not someone. So the objective fun functions can be the same, right? C transpose X in transpose X. How can we rewrite this such that this is um, equivalent to this? Yeah. 
Yes. That's a good one. Bm. Okay, we just need Fi. So you can prove that if it's, again, it's the diagonal of um, let me write this way. Say a y a i one, a i n. Then you can prove that. What's this? F not plus x one plus f uh, x one f one x m f m. This will be a diagonal matrix where what's the jth element of this? So we have from this B, we have Bj, right? And from this first term, we have x1 multiplied with um, a1 j. From the second one, we have x2 multiplied with a2 j, and so on, xm, am, j. And um, so in other ways, this is diagonal, b transpose plus x transpose a transpose. Okay, so it's diagonal b plus ax, right? And that's it, because ax plus b, um, so when this is PSD, it's a diagonal. It means that each, uh, each of its diagonal element is non-negative, and it's the same as then ax plus b is non-negative here. Good? So here is a more complicated question. Um, do you think if there exists an SDP that's not LP? So we proved that any kind of LP is an SDP. But now the question is if we can define a, a SDP problem that's not LP. Who thinks that SDP is more general? Who thinks that they are the same? No one. So let's see an instance for that. Very good. So you can prove that if you consider this problem, minimum C transpose X squared over D transpose X subject to AX plus B is non-negative. Um, and let's assume that a x plus b, if a x plus b is non-negative, then d transposed x is bigger than zero. So it means that in um, when x is feasible, then we don't divide by zero here. We divide by with a positive number. So we need to prove that. So it's easy to see that this is not LP, right? This problem, it's not a linear problem. We, what we want to show now that this is an SDP. And the first observation is that we can rewrite this problem as let's minimize T over T and X subject to, where we have the first, what we have, AX plus B is non-negative. And what's my other constraint? So I want to rewrite this problem um, in such a way I want to simplify the objective. So instead of using this ugly objective, I just want to minimize C. So it's a very often used trick that if you, how you can replace the complicated objective to move that to constraints. So what would be a good constraint now? I cannot hear you. Okay. 
right? So you can see that these two problems are equivalent, right? So, and now the uh, second observation is that this holds if and only if d transpose x is positive, so t times d transpose x minus c transpose x squared is non negative. And what should we do now? Right, so I want to rewrite this as uh, T, C transposed X, C transposed X, D transposed X, PSD. So you can prove that, oops, let's come back. This is non-negative if and only if this matrix is PSD. Because um, we assume that D transpose X is positive, this is positive, and uh, what's the determinant of this? It's T times D transpose X minus D C transpose X, C transpose X squared. Right, so the whole problem can be rewritten as Let's minimize T, subject to. So the other trick is that, uh, so we have this constraint and this constraint, and I can just um, rewrite them in one PSD constraint, AX plus B. This is the first, and the second I just uh, constraint, I just write it here. T, C transpose X. Okay, so what we did that we rewrote this problem as an SDT. In just this case, other, uh, you can also think of that this has to be positive and the sure complement has to be positive. And then you would get the same thing here. But you also know that for a uh, determinant of a PSD matrix is uh, positive, right? Because it's the product of the eigenvalues. And all eigenvalues are non-negative. Um, so there are a few more properties. Um, but our time is <laughs> getting over. So I think, I, Ryan, I let you talk now. Oh, we can have a break and then you talk? Or? Okay, let's have a break and we discuss what to do. So what left is I The second part um, was a case study that stepped through basically all the things you could try for a particular problem. Um, you know, we learned a lot of algorithms, so it just goes through trying to apply each one and trying to figure out um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using each of those methods? And that we're going to get to, just not today. So I'm going to go through the table until the end of class, and then on Thursday um, I'm going to be gone, but Barnabas is going to continue covering SDPs and um, matrix calculus, matrix differentials. Tuesday you guys have your midterm, which you, I'm sure you haven't forgotten about. And then next Thursday we'll go through this case study in detail. So we said on the schedule that the last lecture would be up to lecture 18, which would have been last lecture. So because we didn't get through SDPs, we, we decided that we're going to cover everything up through SDPs. 
So if you look at the schedule, the last thing that's covered were, were the interior point methods. So everything up to the primal dual interior point methods. What's the Pettier point? So barrier methods are? Yeah, right. Okay, well, not STPs. Up until STPs, not including STPs. Strictly less than. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so here's what we've learned so far, kind of roughly speaking. We've learned uh, three classes of methods, but then some, some that don't really fit. Well, actually, all of our methods fit into these classes, but uh, you'll learn some more before the class is over that don't fit into these categories. Well, we learned uh, a bunch of first order methods. So those were like subgradient descent, gradient descent, um, generalized gradient descent, and accelerated gradient, uh, generalized gradient descent, which we didn't really talk about, but that was one of them as well. Um, we learned uh, about Newton's method and then some quasi-Newton methods. So I kind of lumped those together in the same category. So the Newton method uses the Hessian, the quasi-Newton methods try to approximate the Hessian, don't actually use the Hessian itself. And then a bunch of interior point methods. And um, so these comprise a good part of what people study in optimization. So if you took a, a class in optimization, either in another department or, or another school, you'd likely learn these methods. These are really kind of the bread and butter of, of the optimization um, field. So I don't know how many methods you learn off the top of my head. Probably something like nine so far. And we'll learn at least two more for the classes over that aren't in these categories. So the question you're probably asking yourself is, you know, how do I know what to use when? I have a lot of tools available to, a lot of tools at my disposal to solve problems. We've kind of talked about, um, you know, at a high level, some of the disadvantages of some methods versus others, but we haven't really gone through very um, rigorously an example where we try out different methods and, and, uh, and do these thought experiments as to what's going to work and what's not going to work. So. Uh, we're going to do that um, as part of this lecture, and like I said, we'll continue next Thursday. So two methods we'll learn before the course is over. Um, we'll learn actually a bunch of methods that fall under this category of dual methods, and we'll also learn coordinate descent. So this, by this I mean coordinate-wise minimization, but there are many more outside of these two as well. We just don't have time to cover them. It'd be nice if we could cover them, but we just don't have time. So of course I, I you know, I can't claim that I can give you a cookbook for, you know, flip open to a page, you have, you know, an SVM with these parameters, use this method. That doesn't exist. Unfortunately, there's just no such cookbook. Um, there's never a perfect answer as to what to use when. It always depends on the problem. So that's maybe a bit disappointing, but it's also what makes optimization an interesting field. Right? There's always a little bit of thought that has to go into algorithm design, what to use when. So like I said, any real problem you should still kind of treat carefully. But here's some guidelines we're going to talk about. So you might wonder, so what are some important aspects we'd even put on the table when we're talking about the strengths and, we and weaknesses of, of methods? Well, um, here are five that we'll talk about in these next two tables. The first is what assumptions are we making on the criterion function? Right, we always have to make some. Which, what are we making? The second are what are the assumptions we're making about the constraint functions or the constraint set? The third is, um, kind of broadly speaking, how easy does, is this algorithm to implement? Meaning how many uh, tuning parameters, not in the, in the statistical sense, but in the optimization sense, do we have to set to run this method? So these are like backtracking parameters. Um, you know, this is like the barrier parameter, for example, in the interior point methods, stuff like that. And the last two um, characterize the efficiency of the algorithm. One is, what's the cost of each iteration? And the other is, how many iterations do we need to achieve a certain tolerance in terms of um, you know, distance away from the optimal solution? So again, there are, there are more things that maybe you would care about in a particular problem, but we're just going to look at these as guidelines. We're not going to talk about things like, is the algorithm capable of being parallelized? Um, what kind of storage issues are there? Does it need to store large matrices? Um, things like, can the algorithm exploit sparsity in the solution? There, these are all kind of issues that you might um, consider in a, in a problem, but we won't talk about them uh, today, just these general guidelines. All right, so big table of methods, that's all we'll get to before the end of today, and then a case study next week. 
And I don't have a watch, so you'll have to tell me when I'm uh, at the end of class, or I guess everyone will probably yell at me when class is over. So, all right, so here's this table. We saw um, part of this table uh, a couple weeks ago, I think, or a week and a half ago, and I went through it very quickly. I've changed it a bit, and I've, I've added a, a second half to it, so we'll go through it more carefully now. So on the, um, on the columns here, I have a bunch of methods. Gradient ascent, subgradient ascent, proximal gradient, that's just generalized gradient, uh, Newton's method, conjugate gradient, um, and the quasi-Newton method. Oops. And then on the next slide, I've continued with barrier method, primal dual interior point method, and then here's, our, here's two methods that we will learn before the class is over. These are coming up in, uh, I guess, the week, out, the week of after the midterm, we'll talk about these two. ADMM, which is a dual method, and coordinate descent. So we won't go through these very thoroughly now because you guys don't know what they are. But it'll serve as a nice kind of preview as to what we'll see. All right, and then on the, on the rows, I have um, criterion, constraints, optimization parameters, iteration cost, and the convergence rate. How many iterations do we need to achieve a tolerance of, I um, mean, an error of epsilon from the solution? So for, for gradient descent, we assume this uh, smooth criterion function, right? It has to have a gradient. That's what we need to run the algorithm. For subgradient method, we just assume that it's um, convex. So I've, I've kind of not written the fact that f should be convex everywhere here in the, cri in the criterion and in the constraints as well. Um, that's just assumed, right? That's been our kind of our setting so far. For proximal gradient, we have to be able to decompose it as a differentiable function g plus a function h that's not necessarily differentiable, but simple. For Newton's method, we needed two derivatives on f. And for these, these methods here, conjugate gradient and quasi-Newton, we actually also needed two derivatives with f. Okay, so there's different smoothness assumptions here that we're making. And you can imagine the more we assume, the more we can do, but maybe the more costly the method is as well. How about the constraints? Um, for gradient ascent, we can project onto the constraint set. So that's really what we do with constraints. If we know that um, we have a constraint set and we can project onto it easily via the, some operator that we know how to do, then we can handle constraints with gradient descent. That's just projected gradient descent. One way to see that was by viewing this problem, minimize f subject to constraints, as minimize f plus an indicator function. And then we ran proximal gradient where the um, the smooth part was f, and then the non-smooth part was the indicator function, and that just gave us projected gradient descent. Subgradient descent, um, I believe we have this in the slides as well, and we talked about it. It's the same thing. So as long as you can project onto a set, you can do project, you can run a subgradient descent with constraints. And remember, we also talked about in class the fact that projection is not a, f a, f a freebie. So you can write down a set that looks simple, and it can be very complicated to project onto that set. Okay, so there are a bunch of stuff we wrote down in the slides that we know the projection operators to. Otherwise, this projection could be actually just as costly or much more costly than the, the iteration itself. How about proximal gradient descent? Can we handle constraints with proximal gradient descent? Um, so I wrote down constrained prox operator, and I had an explanation of this last time. Does anybody remember what this means? So what if I want to minimize g plus h subject to x is in a set C? How do I do that with generalized gradient descent? Right. So what do you end up getting at the end? At the end of the day, the prox operator is to minimize um, like a least squares term, say y minus x squared plus h of x subject to x lying in c. So that's a constrained, I mean, it, it's, it's the prox operator of h, but it's constrained. That's actually not necessarily easy if we know the prox operator of h or if we know projection. Knowing them together jointly is not trivial. Even if, like I said, even if we know how to project onto C and we know the prox operator of H, putting those together could be complicated. 
for Newton, um, we can really only do, with Newton itself, equality constraints. So we didn't cover this in great detail in class. We talked about it during the KKT condition lecture. I believe Barnabas talked about it in a lecture as well. It's in the book in, in, in some nice detail. Um, so read that if you're still unsure about what that means. But essentially, we can take a Newton step so that we preserve an equality constraint. So if we know that our iterate x satisfies ax equals b, we can move in a direction delta so that a delta equals 0, and also moving in a direction suggested by the inverse Hessian times the gradient, so that we basically always stay feasible with respect to these equality constraints. We can't do projected Newton onto a general constraint set. That's, that's not um, kosher with Newton's method. We only have equality constrained um, Newton at this point. Okay, if we want to do general constraints, then we'll have to introduce like a barrier function or something, which we'll talk about in the next table. For conjugate gradient and quasi-Newton, we have them unconstrained. Okay, so there's a way to connect these to the barrier functions as well. We didn't talk about that. So just with respect to these columns right now, for conjugate gradient and quasi-Newton, they're unconstrained. How about the parameters? Well, these all have step sizes. Um, gradient and proximal gradient are really the same. They just tell us that we can either choose it to be less than or equal to 1 over the Lipschitz constant of the smooth part, or we can backtrack, either one. For subgradient, we had them diminishing. There's no adaptive choice based on backtracking. There's, there's no analog there. So you can already tell that we, kinda, we can't really solve the problem as aggressively, so even if I didn't tell you the rates, you'd guess that probably we'd be slower at subgrading method because we have to use this fixed rule no matter what the problem is. It doesn't even depend on something like the Lipschitz constant or anything like that. It's just a fixed rule. For Newton's method, there was two alternatives. There was a pure Newton method, which can be very fast, but also can be very divergent if you're unlucky. So we can also use a backtracking strategy with Newton as well. It's the same strategy we use with the first order methods. And for conjugate gradient um, and quasi-Newton, um, especially for conjugate gradient, they were a little more complicated, um, but not too much more. So there's a little more complicated version of line search. Or if we use the, the Hessian and conjugate gradient, we just use uh, fixed step size. And for these two quasi-Newton methods, we learned DFP and BFGS, they both apply line search as well. So this row now is somewhat ill-defined. I mean, it's, it's probably the least rigorous of the rows because how do you talk about iteration costs? It depends on what, what the gradient is, what the Hessian is. It's, it's really a little more variable than suggested by this, this row. But still, it's a good guideline. So how about gradient method? Um, generically speaking, it's, it's cheap. All you have to do is compute a gradient, right? That's it. For subgradient method, it's the same thing. We just compute a subgradient. For um, proximal gradient descent, or generalized gradient descent, we have to evaluate the procs at each iteration. So that's, I, said, I put moderately cheap, but that could be as cheap as, you know, as evaluating a gradient. It could be just linear time, for example, soft thresholding, or it could be pretty expensive if the procs is more complicated. So it really depends on what H is. We typically would not even run proximal gradient descent unless H had a, a procs operator that was somewhat reasonable. For Newton's method, it can be moderate to expensive. So moderate in the case where the Hessian has structure and we can solve it quickly, but generically expensive. If the Hessian is just dense, then that takes n cubed time, versus one inner product with the gradient only takes um, n time, right, for gradient descent. And for these, these next two methods, um, the, the whole point of them is that they try to give you the benefit of the Newton method without having to solve these dense linear systems in the Hessian, and a generic Hessian. So they are, they are faster in terms of um, their iteration cost. But again, uh, it depends, I guess, how you implement them. So I put um, moderately cheap for, for conjugate gradient, because right, we're computing gradients and inner products with, with, a, with, a, with a matrix, basically, matrix vector products. And um, moderately cheap for the the quasi-Newton method because they, they invert this Hessian in a very kind of clever way, right? They make successive rank one or rank two updates to the Hessian and they can invert it quickly. How about the, uh, the convergence rate? Well, 
Um, these things are good to keep in mind, too, just so they tell you the flavor of how fast you'd expect to converge with these kind of methods. For gradient method with the most, most basic assumptions, it's just 1 over epsilon. So if you tell me you want a, an error of, with an epsilon of the optimal criterion value, I have to run it for 1 over epsilon iterations. And it gets um, better with, accelera um, with acceleration. It goes down to 1 over square root of epsilon. And it gets um, even better with strong convexity. It goes to log of 1 over epsilon if I have a strongly convex function. For subgradient, this is the slowest that we have. It's 1 over epsilon squared. So that's a pretty substantial difference from 1 over epsilon. And we saw examples of where those two perform pretty differently. And for generalized gradient, it's the same as, as a gradient method. It's just the exact same. But um, now we have to remember that each iteration evaluates a prox. So we're counting iterations here. And the Newton's method and, the, and then these quasi-Newton methods and the, the conjugate gradient method, they're at a much faster rate. So they're very different, even from the strong convex world. They're log, log of 1 over epsilon. So if you tell me that you want um, with an epsilon of the optimal criterion value, I have to take log of log of 1 over epsilon. This is actually like a remarkably small number. So what's... Um, Yeah, so for example, if, if I took e to be 2 to the minus 32, so 1 over e is 2 to the 32, that's the largest number that some um, storage systems on the computer can store, depending on how they're stored. So what's log log of 2 to the 32 if I'm taking the log of base 2? It's just 5, right? So that's, that's really small. So that's why some people say it's constant because in some practical considerations, it just acts like 5. So, I mean, obviously don't take this as gospel. There's a constant here. There's conditions here that make this work. But um, think about what this means. If you want a solution of very high accuracy, if somebody tells you, I really want an accurate solution, then you're going to have to go a lot farther to get there with gradient ascent than you will with Newton's method. So if somebody really cares about accuracy in this solution, then uh, you're probably better off using Newton's method. But if you just kind of want a rough, um, you know, you want a rough approximation of the solution, you don't really care too much about a very fine degree of accuracy, then you're fine running this for, you know, some thousands of iterations. Um, these next two, I didn't want to write down a rate. Um, I asked Barnabas what to put here, and he, he suggested that we just describe it like super linear, so it's faster than this guy. So it's in the realm of Newton. And it's an n-step quadratic rate, so if you take n steps, it's the same as one Newton step, basically. OK, so then here's the newcomers. Um, we'll really only go through the first two columns, because uh, the last two, you don't know what these are yet. So for barrier method and primal dual interior point method, these are the two interior point methods that we learned. We assume that the function is doubly smooth, just like Newton's method. Essentially, you can think of these as allowing us to apply Newton's method with constraints, with an arbitrary constraint set. There are two different ways to do this. They approach the problem in slightly different ways. So as long as I have, as I have constraint functions that are both doubly smooth, for, I mean, smooth for, doubly smooth for Barry method and also for the primal and interior point method, I can run them. Okay, so arbitrary constraint sets defined by hi of x less than or equal to 0, where hi has two derivatives. What are the optimization parameters for these guys? Um, well, they both have the line search parameters. Um, in fact, uh, let's just distinguish them a little bit more finely. For barrier method, one iteration is actually solving a smoothed problem. So I add the barrier term to the objective, and I solve that to precision, to whatever the precision I've specified ahead of time, using Newton's method. Okay, so that's done for a fixed mu. I add, I add mu times the, the barrier function. I solve that with Newton's method until I basically think I've gotten the answer. With uh, primal dual, I just take one step. I don't solve the problem. I take one step, and then I change mu. I take one step, and then I change mu, etc. So that's an important distinction to keep in mind. So let's talk about the parameters for this guy. So I'm just running Newton's method on the inside, the inner loop. So I can either do that with a fixed step size, t equals 1 which is the pure Newton method. And I could try to just 
that's you know, playing, living life a little dangerously because it might diverge. Or I could use line search. But on the outside, I also have to fix a schedule. I have to specify a way to um, change the barrier parameter. So I have to, maybe I'm going to multiply it by a constant each time. I have to specify that constant. So I have the backtracking parameters. I have the initial barrier parameter. And I also have um, the way to change the barrier parameter across iterations. For um, the primal dual method, there's no real um, sense in taking a fixed step size. Okay, we're not really doing Newton's method on any particular problem. We're taking one Newton step. So we typically always do it with backtracking. So we have the backtracking parameters and the same thing. The initial barrier parameter and the way to change the barrier parameter across iterations. So there's a lot more you have to worry about here than the other methods. Right? You just have to think about tuning more parameters. And these can really affect how fast it converges in practice. How about the iteration costs? Um, so here I'm defining one iteration of the barrier method to be one Newton solve. So I just solve one Newton's problem. I solve, um, sorry, I solve one problem that's smooth via Newton's method. That's one iteration. And then I change the barrier parameter. I solve the problem again. So that's a very expensive iteration if we're considering an iteration. Right, because I have to actually go through an entire, um, I have to run Newton's method until convergence on a smooth problem. For the primal dual interior point method, if, I, if I'm considering one iteration, one Newton step, then it's, it's the same cost as one step of Newton's method, right? So it's kind of moderately expensive. Was there a question? Here. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, there's, there's no reason I, can, I can't solve that inner problem with whatever method I want. But um, there's kind of two sets of, um, well, there, there's two things you would think about. First is theoretical. Well, what can I say about it converging if I use gradient method? And the second is practical. So um, theoretically speaking, the theory all depends on Newton's method because it can achieve a very high degree of accuracy within a, a sh few number of iterations. So this rate we're going to get to is only proved for Newton's method. I'm not aware of any theory that tells you you can do the same with gradient method because the total iteration count might not be very well controlled in that case. Practically speaking, um, I'm not really sure how it performs to put gradient in the, in the inside. But I know that if you stop Newton short with the barrier method, you'll run into trouble. So actually, you, it's very kind of sensitive to running Newton's method to a very high degree of accuracy. If you stop Newton's method short, then the barrier method could start having trouble. So I would imagine that if you use gradient method, since you're not kind of converging to a very small of epsilon, you'd also run into the same problems. But I don't know. I don't have a lot of practical experience. That was a very good question. OK, so what about the rate? So they actually kind of both have the same rate. Barnabas just um, put this one up on the slide and start a lecture. Um, if we talk about the number of iterations total, they both require log of 1 over epsilon iterations until we get an error of epsilon away from the solution. Remember, iterations meant different things here. This meant like entire problems solved by Newton, and this meant um, Newton steps. But actually, in your textbook, you can see that they prove that if you want to count the number of Newton steps taken by Barry method total, because right, it's going to take a bunch in each iteration, it's still going to be log of 1 over epsilon. So they're actually comp they're pretty comparable in terms of their rate of convergence. So just took a, take a gander back at the previous page. Newton's method was log log 1 over epsilon. For a, for a smooth problem without constraints, we were able to converge very quickly. This is still fast, but it's completely reasonable to expect that it would be slower. Right? We have to apply Newton's method many times in a row here. Or here we're trying taking Newton steps for a bunch of perturbed problems. So it's, it's completely reasonable that they'd be slower. And that they actually achieve the um, kind of the same rate of convergence than if we had a strongly convex function and we were just trying to optimize it unconstrained. Okay, so again, it's, it's helpful just to kind of compare across rows of this table. Um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Well, I think I'm going to go through four minutes. Okay, I'll do this in, in two minutes, then you can go two minutes early. I'll just go through ADMM and coordinate descent real quick. And then you can kind of get excited to come to class in two weeks, hopefully. So what do ADMM and coordinate descent assume? They're actually very different from each other and from the other methods. 
For ADNM, we assume that the function is block separable. So you'll kind of maybe spot a bit of a similarity here to the proximal gradient assumption. But actually, we assume that not f decomposes as g of x plus h of x, but that we can separate um, f of x comma z as g of x plus h of z. So we can separate it in terms of how it operates on the variables. We can handle equality constraints um, always. And we can handle some inequality constraints. Okay, that will become more precise when we learn the method. What are the um, parameters you need to tune here? There's one, and it's called the augmented Lagrangian parameter. So there's theory that tells you to converge for a fixed value, but in practice we vary it. How do, what are the iteration costs um, associated with this method? They're either cheap to expensive. So it's a full range of, um, of uh, efficiency here. It could be as cheap as gradient or as expensive as Newton. It depends on how you implement ADMM. There's actually a lot of flexibility with how you set up the algorithm. And you typically would try to avoid, obviously, the, the um, setups that give you expen expensive iteration costs. And we maybe wouldn't even run it if we can't find a way to run the iterations cheaply. What about its convergence rate? Well, this is not really known in general. So this is a difference from all other me methods. These two methods are much less well studied in the pure optimization community. But they're very popular within statistics and machine learning communities because they have a lot of applications. But it's not really known how these um, scale in general in terms of their convergence rates. In special cases, there are convergence rates. But in general, we're still kind of figuring that out. And they're both arguably somewhat new in terms of when people started caring about them. Practically, the opinion is that these scale like first order methods. So if you want a very accurate solution, you have to run ADMM for tens of thousands of iterations. So there's kind of like a first order method where I just would run it to get a pretty good solution. And I wouldn't expect to converge to high accuracy very quickly. That's just kind of the feel, I guess, from people who use ADMM. And like I said, for special cases, that's made precise, but not in general. How about coordinate descent? It's a very different set of assumptions. Um, we assume that our function decomposes as a smooth function plus one that's component-wise separable. So I can have f of x as g of x, where g is smooth, plus h of x. And h has to decompose as h as the sum of hi of xi. So it has to be um, a sum of functions of the individual components. They can be non-smooth. That's totally fine. And how about constraints? I can do any constraints that are component-wise separable. So I can have, for example, um, if I can write the constraint as the sum of indicators on each component, then I can handle it with coordinate descent. So a box constraint is totally fine. Here's the nice thing about coordinate descent. There are no parameters to tune in terms of the algorithm. There's none. There's no step size, nothing. We actually cycle through minimizing along each component exactly. So that's appealing in some sense compared to the other methods. Again, the iteration um, costs here go through the full range. It's either very cheap if you happen to be solving a problem that's amenable to, to a good coordinate descent approach, or it's very expensive. It just entirely depends on the problem and how you set it up. This is also an algorithm in which careful implementation is really important. Even if it's a, a problem that's well suited to coordinate descent, a naive implementation could be really slow. And last thing, uh, again, it's not known in general. It's known in some special cases how this scales. But when it's applicable, they tend to behave practically faster than first order methods. So there's somewhere in between first order and second order methods in terms of their convergence rates. OK, so that's it. Um, we'll talk about these two methods the week after the midterm. Um, make sure to come to recitation tomorrow. I think we'll send an email soon, but recitation is going to be a midterm review. So if you have questions, um, come to that session with them because that'll be uh, you, all your chairs will be there and they'll be very helpful. So.